Today's lecture will be about dislocations in thin films. As I have said before, uh, a very brief uh, recapitulation of what uh, you have done already with, uh, with Lawrence about the bulk. Uh, we classify the dislocations based on their uh, geometrical relationships, uh, depending on how the Burgers vector and the dislocation line vector are oriented with respect to each other. So if they are perpendicular to each other, we speak about edge dislocation and that we see, for example, in here. If they are parallel, we speak about screw dislocations that we can see in this configuration. And anything in between, uh, we would call mixed dislocations when the angle is different. It is important to realize, and again, all of these things uh, will somehow uh, come up today, that the dislocation cannot end in the crystal, so it must either form a closed loop or end at the free surface or at the grain boundary or any other defect. Uh, so we see that, for example, on the uh, on this cube here, where the dislocation goes inside, propagates through the material and comes outside at this point. That means if we would look from the top, the dislocation line looks this way. The Burgers vector along the whole dislocation line is the same, is constant, and is always oriented uh, upwards in this case, whereas the dislocation line direction changes its, uh, its uh, direction. So what we can uh, conclude from here is that first of all, along one dislocation line, you might have different types of dislocations, different characters from purely edge, as in this ra uh, range, to purely screw, as here, uh, over the mixed parts, we can also say that the Burgers vector remains constant along the whole dislocation line, again, unless uh, dislocations react or uh, merge together or something else. Uh, and the pretty much only degree of freedom the dislocation has when it moves through the material is the change of the dislocation line. Another part of classification are uh, the length of the Burgers vector, and uh, I will not talk about this here in detail. I think you have covered this with, uh, with Lawrence again. Uh, another important classification of this location, especially when it comes to hexagonal materials, are depending on the uh, vector of their Burgers vector. So if the Burgers vector is along the A-axis of the hexagonal material, then we call them A-type dislocations if they are along the C direction, so along the triple O one direction, uh, we call them C-type dislocations. And uh, then we have also the uh, dislocation with the Burgers vector along the prismatic uh, direction, which are the A plus C-type dislocations. And again, I'll be showing here some uh, older examples from my former work on hexagonal materials where this terminology will become important. And finally, what is most important for today's lecture are terms such as misfit and threading dislocations. So as soon as you start overgrowing material epitaxially, that means that the material from uh, in, in the thin film, the overgrown material uh, has a certain crystallographic relation to your substrate, uh, then either the material really grows uh, epitaxially, so they are uh, perfectly aligned crystallographic planes, or because of the lattice mismatch, the overgrown material starts relaxing some lattice mismatch, which leads to the uh, misfit strain. It starts generating it by uh, relaxing it by generating misfit dislocations. The misfit dislocations would be lying at the interface of what we have here. In this picture is a plan view. We are looking through the, uh, from the top to the substrate, towards the substrate. And we look at the network of these location lines at the interface between the thin film and the, uh, the substrate. These dislocations would be presumably edge type dislocations. That, that means that every now and on, there is an edit plane in the thin film which relaxes the lattice mismatch. 
Those we call then misfit dislocations. Again, something very, very important for the uh, terms that we'll be using later on. Now, some of those misfit dislocations may propagate along the whole interface. Some of them might actually turn upwards and propagate through the thin film. So unlike in this picture where we were looking from the top to the bottom, here we are looking uh, in the cross-sectional view. So we see here the substrate and here is the thin film. The misfit dislocations are along this interface, which is aligned here in this projection. Uh, the, uh, and some of these dislocations would turn upwards and propagate thread through the thin film towards the free surface. And those are called threading dislocations. And now uh, these threading dislocations are typically very detrimental for the uh, optoelectronic properties for which we want to use these uh, thin films. So we want to control them, control their density, potentially get rid of them, uh, and so on. I think this is enough for the terminology, and we can directly dive into, um, into the properties of these dislocations. And again, I believe that you have discussed with Lawrence the possibility to calculate the dislocation uh, energy. So as a repetition, the dislocation energy for pure edge dislocation is, uh, some, is, is given by uh, some prelogarithmic term, which depends on the edge component of the Burgess vector, on the shear modulus, and on the Poisson's ratio. This is in the approximation of isotropic elastic, uh, elastic isotropic material. And uh, after that, we have a term which expresses the volume which is elastically strained around the dislocation, elastically strained because of generating the dislocation, the small R0, or sometimes also called RC, uh, corresponds to the radius of the core. So that's where the C would be coming from, from the word core. And that's the region where actually we have really the broken bonds and we have the plastic deformation. Capital R corresponds to the outer integration radius, uh, meaning that the uh, energy of the edge dislocation diverges in infinitely large medium. Um, the capital R is normally taken as the distance, for example, to the free surface, to the uh, grain boundary, or half of a distance between the dislocations if we speak about the dislocation array. When we have edge dislocation, uh, sorry, screw dislocation, the formula looks very similar. Now the dependence is on the screw component of the Burgess vector. We have again the shear modulus. And in this case, we do not have any process ratio in the formula. Uh, and again, followed by the logarithmic term. When we have a general dislocation in elastic uh, medium, then we simply combine those two, value, uh, th those two formulae where the angle theta, which plays a significant role here, corresponds to the angle between the dislocation line and the Burgess vector. So for theta equal 90 degrees, we get edge dislocation. For theta equal uh, 0 or 180 degrees, we get screw dislocation. Eventually, this formula that we have here is the central formula for majority of the evaluations that we'll be doing here today. What happens if we are not in elastically isotropic medium? Well, things are principally the same. So that's the easy part to say it's the same on the paper, but formally uh, they, they become much more involved mathematically, all right? So you can see, for example, here, a general formula for the hexagonal symmetry, in which you can again identify the pre-logarithmic term here we have the dependence on the components of the Burgess vector, the other parts, the co uh, coefficients or constants, Bn and Cn, and Pn would be some functions of elastic constants, the hexagonal material. And after this prelogarithmic term, we have again a, a following the, uh, the, the logarithmic dependence. So from this point of view, it's the same. This formula can be explicitly evaluated only for certain orientations uh, and geometries. So here we have 
the example of a dislocation which is aligned along the 001 direction, so along the hexagonal axis. And uh, we have then, or we end up with formulae which are very, very similar to what we had in the isotropic case. So again, there is the either edge component or screw component, and then we have here the uh, compliance, uh, compliances, elastic compliances. Maybe a question here. Um, why do you think that the evaluation of the dislocation energy is way easier uh, when the dislocation is oriented along the triple O one axis? Do you have any idea? Because uh, it is more easy to uh, measure the length in of one. Uh, line that is straight right but the dislocation would be in principle straight even if it's along the one one bar two zero direction so along the a axis right we always speak here about infinitely long straight dislocations i should have said mm -hmm. but if you look at the formula that we get here for the screw dislocation it is strikingly similar to the formula that we had for the um, for the isotropic case, right? That is pretty much the same. Only here we have now the S44 instead of the shear modulus that we had there before. The reason for that is that actually the elastic strain field that we get around this dislocation is isotropic. The plane triple O one to which this triple uh, one direction is perpendicular to is uh, elastically isotropic. And so the strain field that this dislocation generates is the same as in the isotropic case, because we speak again uh, about the plane strain problem, right? So this, this, this is the reason why this, especially this hexagonal triple uh, one axis uh, is so, or it's, it's um, doable to be evaluated analytically. For other directions of the dislocation line, we simply have to treat this numerically. If we do so, then we end up with a general formula that looks again very, very similar to what we had before. Uh, we can uh, decompose the final formula into the logarithmic term and the pre logarithmic factor which is just a geometry factor taking into account the material properties via the elastic constants and the Burgess factor itself characterizing the dislocation and the relationship of the dislocation uh, line and the Burgess factor. This uh, pre-logarithmic factor can be further decomposed into really the Burgess factor components and the tensor, second order tensor, uh, which contains the elastic properties and actually the dislocation line direction or the uh, or orientation of the crystal, right? So this is now the uh, factor, which is the, or the form of the dislocation line energy in its most general form. Right, so what can we learn from here? Um, one thing is we can think about the optimum geometrical configuration. The energy obviously depends on the relationship, mutual relationship between the dislocation line direction and the Burgess vector, which in the case of uh, isotropic material is given purely by the angle theta between those two. And if you remember the formula that we had there before, um, the function was having in the Nominator one minus cosine angle theta, and so, oh, right. And so, so essentially, it was uh, depending on the maybe it's cosine squared, no, right? One minus cosine squared uh, theta. Uh, so it was purely depending on the uh, cosine function, right? Now, where do we get minimum uh, minimum energy? Well, that's where when the uh, cosine is. Uh, equal to one, right? When is it equal to one? 
it's equal to one when theta is equal to um, is, is equal to oh, sorry. zero. Uh, is equal to zero, right? But uh, what I want to sorry, what I want to say is that there should be nu, so the Poisson's ratio. That that's my mistake, right? So the formula once again had in dominate to one minus nu the Poisson's ratio cosine and then cosine squared theta exactly. So now the minimum we get for theta equals zero or theta equal 180 degrees is correctly uh, said by one of you. That means for the screw configuration. And again, in many of the dislocation textbooks, you will read this formulation, then the screw dislocation or screw configuration process is the lowest energy configuration. Fair enough. We got it here for firstly bulk material, secondly for elastic isotropic material. What happens when we do not have elastic isotropic material? Well, then we can investigate this. Uh, because we have now the tools how to do this, we essentially look at the dependence of the pre-logarithmic factor, a cont, so the cont means uh, that we do everything in the continuum uh, approximation, so we use the elasticity of the continuum and we evaluate this as a function of the two angles phi and theta, which define the mutual relationship with, or that, that define the um, the orientation of the dislocation line direction for a given Burgess vector. And I'll be showing here an example for gallium nitride, which exactly <coughs> excuse me, which possesses this hexagonal symmetry. So for the gallium nitride, now uh, it comes fairly clear why I uh, was before talking about this A, C, and A plus C type dislocations. If we take the a type dislocation, so that means the Burgess vector is along the A axis, then we get the uh, pre logarithmic form or pre logarithmic term, a cont, uh, as a function of angles theta and phi, as shown on this, uh, on this uh, plot. And before we come to that, let us analyze what happens for the C type dislocation. So when the Burgess vector is along the C axis, and we now choose certain different directions of the dislocation line, right? So first observation is that it does not depend on the angle phi. So it does not depend uh, where is the uh, dislocation line oriented to. All it depends uh, on is the angle theta. That means the inclination away from the triple uh, one axis. Well, again, the reason for this behavior is that the triple one plane is elastically isotropic. So it really doesn't matter for the stored elastic strain energy, uh, where is the dislocation line really uh, pointing to? All what it depends on is the inclination away from the triple one axis. The second observation we make here is that the minimum is obtained for uh, theta equal to zero or 180 degrees. And again, what does this mean? Well, that means that the dislocation line and the Burgess vector are parallel or anti-parallel. Or in other words, that again, the, uh, the, the classical conclusion that the uh, screw type dislocation is the lowest energy configuration holds true. Fine. Now let's have a look at more complicated or, 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 or the case which actually uh, negates this, what is normally assumed as a general true. And that is the A-type dislocation, right? So first things first, we get now a dependence on the angle phi. Well, that makes perfect sense. Our Burgess vector is along the uh, A-axis. And of course, if I have the dislocation line direction, which is, uh, which is 90 degrees away, so edge type dislocation, but the dislocation line is along the C-axis or along the uh, one, uh, zero, 1 bar 1, 0 axis, also with 90 degrees, the behavior is expected to be very different. That's fine. So we get a dependence on the angle phi. Now, where do we get the minima? 
the minima are actually obtained here for phi equal to zero or 180 degrees. So phi is either zero or 180 degrees. And theta is around 60 or 120 degrees. That means that we get it, here we have 60 degrees, 120, that means it points up and down, right? And then here, so we get, of course, four equivalent uh, directions. The one which is uh, for phi equal to zero and 60 degrees is the same uh, line as for phi equal to 180 and 120 degrees, which would be this line here. And uh, the other two points, these guys are essentially defining this line. What is important to realize here is that now our dislocation has a mixed geometry. We have a non 90 degrees, non zero uh, angle between the dislocation line direction and the Burgess vector. And so in this particular case, we get that the lowest energy configuration is obtained for mixed dislocation, not for a screw dislocation. So the take home message here is that as soon as a, a more the complicated symmetries than elastic, uh, than, than isotropic symmetry come into the play, the things might become more complicated, more involved. Right, but we want to talk about something else than bulk materials, right? We want to talk about dislocations in thin films. And so uh, in that case, we have also only a finite length of the dislocation line. Uh, the dislocation line presumably would go from the interface between the thin film and the substrate. So when we start actually uh, bending the misfit dislocation upwards and create the threading dislocation. And between the free surface, again, the dislocation cannot end inside of the material, right? So what we have now is the geometry of the following thing. We have a substrate, then we have a dislocation, which is here, a misfit dislocation, which now turns upwards, okay? Uh, we have a thin film of a finite thickness. And that means that our dislocation, when it turns upwards, it can have either very short length or it can have a longer length or even longer length. Right? And since the total energy of the dislocation now matters, we need to figure out the dislocation, not only the dislocation energy per unit length, as we did before, which is purely given by the prelogarithmic term, but we have to multiply it also by the actual length of the dislocation. So it could happen that you get very short dislocation line where the energy per unit length is actually not a minimum and still the product of these two values would minimize the overall energy of the dislocation. And so let's have a look at this again for the gallium nitride, uh, where we actually figure out that if the, sorry, if the orientation of our film is in such a way that the interface is the 0001 facet, so it's the hexagons really grow on their basal plane. Uh, then for uh, Burgess vector along the A-axis, as well as for along the C-axis, the dislocation line directions would like to be aligned vertically. That's fine. But already for the mixed type dislocation, we get that the minimum energy is obtained for theta angle equal to 16 degrees. That means that again, what I have now here, this is our thin film. Here is a substrate. And the dislocation starts threading from somewhere here. It has a Burgess vector, which is the A plus C direction. 
and the dislocation line in the in this particular case would be inclined roughly by 16 degrees away from the horizontal axis right and this is uh, sorry from the vertical axis and this is for the case when this interface is 0001 plane so we get a dislocation which is a plus c type dislocation but the geometrical arrangement is actually a mixed dislocation right whereas for the c type dislocation while well, the burgers vector is uh, vertical uh, the for that one, we have shown before that the smallest pre-logarithmic term is obtained for the screw configuration, which is also the shortest, uh, the, the shortest distance. So this is not a surprising result. But for the Burgess vector along the a-axis, so this is now the Burgess vector equal to a, we have shown on the previous slide that in the bulk, the ideal configuration would be with a mixed type dislocation where there was the angle uh, of roughly 60 degrees. Now we are saying that in this particular case, actually the lowest total energy, which is the energy per unit length times the length of the dislocation is obtained for an edge type dislocation. The dislocation line would be along the triple uh, one direction, whereas the Burgess vector is along the uh, a direction, all right? So we get here even uh, more confusing result saying that for a certain geometrical configuration, edge type dislocation minimizes the uh, overall configuration, the overall energy of the, uh, of the system. And things might become more involved and more complicated when we consider different orientations of the interface. So the hexagonal gallium nitride can be grown on very different, uh, on very different uh, substrates and therefore uh, enforcing that the vertical direction has different, uh, uh, different configurations or are along the different direction, meaning that then we get, uh, again, depending on the actual geometry, different results as shown here. And for example, for the uh, prismatic plane, the one bar one zero one plane. So that would be uh, that the, this gray plane is the uh, actual interface to the substrate. Uh, what we see very clearly from this projection is that none of the uh, a plus C or C type dislocations is actually uh, perpendicular to the uh, to the interface, so it's not al aligned along the uh, horizontal, sorry, along the vertical axis. And even the A type dislocations uh, would have a certain slight preferred spread of their directions. All right. So now a uh, second topic, we have presumed now that we do have the misfit dislocations, which turn into the threading dislocations and which propagate through the thin film. But a question is, do we get the misfit dislocations at all, right? Maybe we can really avoid them completely because the material would not like to generate them. And so to estimate whether they are preferred or not, we will uh, evaluate something which is called a critical thickness in heteroepitaxy. Consider that you have a substrate and a thin film, which are crystallographically compatible. That means they have uh, compatible crystal structures. Now, they have different lattice constants, in-plane lattice constants. So when we take the thin film, we have two possibilities how to fit it on top of a substrate. The first one is that we strain the thin film, so we expand it to fit it on the substrate. Well, if we do that, we store strain energy in the thin film. 
the strain energy is given by the lattice mismatch. So how much are these lattice constants different? And is proportional to the thickness of the film. Right? The thicker the film, the more strain energy we have stored in the system, simply because the strain energy uh, is obtained by a volume integral over the strain and stress. Um, the other possibility we have is that we relax this misfit strain by introducing the misfit dislocation. Well, that's great because then we have no misfit strain here, the material is unstrained, and we actually uh, end up with zero or very low strain energy. However, we have to pay something for this, and that is the dislocation energy itself. That, so by introducing the dislocation, we of course deform the material locally here. We put the upper material in uh, compression, the bottom material in tension. This compression eventually compensates for the uh, misfit strain. So that is why it leads to the total strain being uh, zero here. And the uh, dislocation energy needs to be added into the uh, overall energy balance when we try to compare whether it's energetically more favorable to have a strained film or a film with containing dislocation of the interface. The strain energy, as we said before, is linearly proportional to the thickness of our film. The dislocation line energy is proportional to the logarithm of the thickness of the film, right? Again, I uh, refer you to one of the first slides that we had here today when we spoke about the analytical form of the dislocation uh, of the formula for the dislocation energy. So that means that we are uh, evaluating as a function of thickness, the dislocation line energy which goes as an LNR versus, so right, versus some linear function. So I haven't drawn it properly uh, because it never touches through. So we would need to do something like this. All right, good. So what does it mean? Uh, this, this line, which is not very linear, is now uh, the misfit energy, which goes as a linear function of the thickness. So firstly, we say that the dislocation energy is negative for very small uh, thicknesses of the film. Well, this is nonsense, right? We uh, cannot have energy gain by introducing the dislocation inside. And it simply means that anywhere here in this area and probably up to the region somewhere here, uh, we are in the regime, we are in thicknesses in which our elastic theory breaks. We are essentially inside of the core radius, right? So the whole evaluation makes only sense from core radius onwards. Good. The second thing we can observe then is that if we consider these thicknesses, which are typically of the order of uh, Burgess vector and thicker, then we start with the, the, the misfit strain being lower than the dislocation energy. Well, that means that for very thin films, it is preferable not to introduce the misfit energies and instead have really uh, the uh, strained, elastically strained filmed uh, following the lattice parameter of the substrate. When we, however, grow thicker, the dislocation energy becomes smaller than the energy of the fully strained material. And so there will be all of a sudden a thermodynamic driving force for creating the dislocation 
and thereby to lowering the overall energy of the system. And this crossover here, this is labeled as the critical thickness. And so below the critical thickness, we expect to have material grown uh, fully strained without misfit dislocations above critical thickness, the system experiences thermodynamic driving force for creation, nucleation of the dislocations and for uh, overall strain relaxation by misfit dislocations. So we can try to evaluate this. Uh, you end up with famous critical thickness plots as are shown here. In, on the left-hand side, we have exactly this for silicon germanium grown on top of selenium. Uh, on the x-axis, we have the germanium fraction. So with increasing amount of germanium in the thin film, the lattice parameter increases, the overall strain energy with the thickness decreases, uh, sorry, uh, increases and thereby the critical thickness decreases. It becomes earlier favorable to overgrow the film with, uh, uh, with dislocations, to introduce dislocations, right? Uh, on the right-hand side, we have the same graph. Again, uh, the critical thickness now evaluated using three different uh, models, the one that we discussed before about really balancing the energy, the misfit strain energy with the dislocation energy is this uh, energy balance model. So this is the uh, red curve that we have here. And the data points that are shown in here say whether for a given composition of our thin film, in this particular case, indium gallium nitride grown on top of gallium nitride, whether the misfit dislocations were observed, and that's the full symbols here, or whether they were not observed. That was only one case in here. <clears throat> All right, so a um, couple of comments to this. Firstly, that the dislocations are observed when we are above the critical thickness line. That's good, right? We say that there exists thermodynamic uh, driving force for their generation, and indeed, they were observed. Secondly, that they were not observed below the critical thickness. Again, good. This is the result that we want to say. We want to guarantee that below the critical thickness, no misfit dislocations should appear. But lastly, you may say the model is completely crap because we have some, critical, uh, some dislocations observed even here below the critical thickness. Uh, to that point, I just have to uh, point your attention to the axis that we have here, where we speak actually about the film thicknesses, which are uh, in the order of two to three nanometers, which is extremely thin, right? And so it means that eventually we have such a high uh, indium content here that the lattice mismatch between indium, gallium nitride and gallium nitride itself is so large that actually the dislocations become favorable pretty much from the beginning. It is impossible to grow a dislocation-free ingan on top of gallium nitrate. One last comment to this slide. Uh, please uh, take into account that the models here are so-called equilibrium models, equilibrium theories. So they describe the situation, what would be happening if we allow infinite time for the material to generate the dislocations and to come to equilibrium. In other words, it can well happen that you do not observe any dislocations even above the critical thickness because the system didn't have enough time, probably enough thermal energy to generate the dislocations and to propagate them to the interface to finally lower its uh, thermodynamic uh, potential, its total energy. We can improve the energy balance model by adding the term which we have neglected up to now. And this is the dislocation core energy. So once again, uh, if you remember our uh, energy of the dislocation per unit length, 
was some pre-logarithmic term times ln r over r0, right? Or rc, core radius. And now this term that we have here corresponds to the radius in which we said, okay, we don't know what is the actually energy stored in this area because we cannot describe it using elasticity theory. That means we cannot do there the integration that led us to this formula. And up to now, maybe without realizing it, we have completely omitted this term. But what we should do is that we now add here also the core energy. So we add also the contribution uh, for these broken bonds and this actually very significant contribution for um, especially small thicknesses of the, of the films, because then the uh, radius of the dislocation core is comparable with the film thickness. And of course, by neglecting this part, we neglect actually a huge fraction of the energy related to the dislocation, right? So uh, we, should, we should do this. Now, I think that graph similar to this has been discussed with Lawrence already before. So again, I'm skipping the details here. What we just see here on the right-hand side is now the evaluation of the total energy of the system as a function of radius of our model. So we increase the radius, we put more and more and more atoms in the system and simply evaluate the total energy. And we see that from a certain uh, radius in this uh, log lin log logarithmic linear plot, the energy very, very nicely follows uh, or follows the linear dependence on logarithm R. So this is exactly our continuum result. But below a certain threshold, this dependence is very debatable. The data points are scattered. And since we do not want really to get into the troubles of describing everything on the, um, on the uh, discrete level, this is beyond the capabilities of our linear elasticity theory, we simply say that below this radius, that's our smallest available amount of material around the dislocation, we know what is the energy. We label this as a core energy, and we also label this dislocation core radius as RC, right? And above that, we then add, depending on the thickness of our cylinder around the dislocation, we add the, the energy, which depends on the logarithm of R. Right, so essentially we correct this formula for E or When we do that, now our models improve. They improve in the sense that for the indium gallium and as well as for aluminum gallium nitride grown on gallium nitride, the curves do not drop to zero that quickly. Uh, we can evaluate it now for different slip systems depending on which kind of a geometrical relation of these locations we take into account. And again, I would like to point your attention now to the fact that if you do this evaluation, taking into account the dislocation core energy, we have no of these experimental observations, these individual data points, and you see that there are plenty of them from different papers. These individual numbers here, they represent different publications where these observations were reported. We never observe any of the field symbols below the critical thickness line. That means the dislocations, when they were observed, they were always above the critical thickness. Voila, the critical thickness models work, right? And they also say that below the critical thickness, whenever we have the observation, the symbols are empty, which means no misfit dislocations were observed. Again, great result. And finally, it also shows the equilibrium properties of our model, because there are also observations where, which were done for much thicker films, 
and our critical thickness, still without observing the dislocations. Well, because probably the growth was so fast that the dislocations didn't have enough time to nucleate and propagate to the thin uh, to the surface. Right? Uh, remember that most of these properties uh, and the motion of dislocations is related to either uh, diffusion which is thermally activated process in the case of uh, diffusing the screw components or in the case of, uh, uh, or, or sorry, not screw components, uh, in the case of climbing the, the uh, dislocations, in the case of gliding them, we still have to overcome with the dislocation, the so-called pyrals barriers. Right? So it has to overcome the periodic, uh, uh, periodic potential coming from the discrete uh, discrete nature of the crystals. And even for this to happen spontaneously, we need certain thermal activation energy. So that is why I'm saying that uh, the equilibrium hasn't been reached for the open symbols which are above the critical thickness lines. In any way, for the engineering purposes, what we want to predict is what is the critical thickness, right? What is the maximum thickness of the film? We can guarantee that no dislocations will appear. <clears throat> Good. I have here uh, two quick last topics. The first one is uh, what can happen with the dislocation density, right? We want to get rid of the dislocations and how can we get rid of them? We said that the dislocations can end only at the free surface potentially at the defect, so grain boundaries and so on, or if two dislocations with favorable uh, geometrical configuration meet and so-called react. This reaction is based on so-called Frank's rule. So if we sum up the squared Burgess vectors of the dislocations which enter, really geometrically enter, a certain uh, dislocation knot, and we compare it with the dislocation, hypothetical dislocation, which would continue with a Burkes vector that is a vectorial sum of the incoming dislocation vectors. If the outgoing vector squared is smaller than the incoming vectors, Burgess vector squared, uh, then the reaction will proceed. Now, where does this come from? Again, uh, realize what was the dislocation uh, energy, how, how that was plotted. It was that the dislocation per unit length is proportional to the Burgess vector squared. Then we had there some uh, of the prefectors that depended on the elastic constants. And then we had the LNR over R term. So, what we are saying here is that if the dislocation uh, if the energy corresponding to the dislocations that come to the dislocation knot is larger than what would be a dislocation energy of this large combined dislocation, and this would proceed, right? So again, this uh, Frank's rule is nothing else than energy minimization. We are trying to find such a configuration when possible, which minimizes the uh, overall energy related to this defect. Right? So if I can merge two dislocations into one, which will have smaller energy than the two dislocations, then this, this will happen. And that is what we observe in here, sorry, in this picture. So for example, you see that here we have a threading dislocation, here we have another one. They eventually come and meet here and uh, continue as a single dislocation. We also see such things as here, we have one dislocation, another one, they meet and they so-called annihilate each other. So they had opposite Burgess vectors. It's like an uh, extra half plane from bottom, extra half plane from top. And when they meet, when they come together, they actually uh, annihilate these two defects and uh, the system continues with no dislocation, right? Also here, we see nicely the uh, dislocation reactions. Here we see it. And most importantly, you see that near to the interface, there are plenty of uh, 
threatening dislocations. Eventually, here on the top, there is only a few of these dislocations, presumably with longer uh, Burgess vectors. And uh, such modeling, such uh, evaluations can be used to predict the estimation of the, um, again, the evolution of the dislocation density. So uh, here is more schematically written exactly what I have told you now with the annihilation and reduction of dislocations, uh, which can be based on the Frank's rule and be put in such a table, so-called reaction table, which says that for a given configuration here, again, everything's related to the uh, gallium nitride in the hexagonal phase uh, when it grows. It just says, if C-type dislocation meets another C-type dislocation, what will be the product of this reaction? Well, it says they will not react, right? Because the initial dislocation energy is proportional to the C squared plus C squared. So that's two C squared. Whereas if they would react, the final Burgess vector is two C and therefore the overall energy would be proportional to four C squared, which is larger than two C squared. So no reaction will proceed. If, however, a dislocation with Burgess vector C meets another one with minus C, they will annihilate. They will cancel out each other because, again, the resulting dislocation well, will have Burgess vector zero, so there will be no dislocation and the energy is reduced. Right? We also see that, for example, if such dislocation and such dislocation meet, there will be still two dislocations coming out of the reaction but with overall smaller energy. Again, this Burgess vector and this Burgess vector squared uh, uh, is larger than 2a squared that we have here. And with such reaction table, you can proceed with modeling this step by step. When you say the dislocations, they always, when I overgrow my material, they propagate in the direction which is uh, the energetically most favorable direction towards the free surface. So that's the first part that we did here in our uh, in our uh, lecture today. And secondly, if they meet, then we look into the reaction table and we say they do react or they don't react and maybe they continue. So um, I have here a movie, unfortunately it doesn't work in this, uh, in this presentation format, but I'll put it for you on the on the Moodle and you can have a look at it how this really happens, right? This is a very simplistic 2D simulation. However, it provides you with an insight what really happens uh, in the real material. We see here, how does the density uh, of the dislocations, here expressed as the number of dislocations in our model, how does that decrease as a function of the thickness of our film when it grows, right? So we see the, here this exponential decay of the number of dislocations. And uh, this uh, on the right hand, uh, sorry, left hand side, we have the same thing for now measured experimentally. So of course the absolute values, here we have numbers of dislocations, here we have density, they are not comparable, but the trend, the understanding of where does this decay of the dislocation density come from, we have gained now. It comes from the, uh, from the dislocation uh, interactions, from the dislocation reactions, uh, and therefore reducing the dislocation density. All right, and the very final thing that I have here is about the interactions of dislocations with free surfaces, right? What happens when a dislocation is in bulk? It introduces a certain stress field. Uh, the stress field uh, generates the stress, the, the self-stress of a dislocation. And uh, we have evaluated this, or hopefully you have evaluated this with, with uh, uh, Lorentz, which led to such formulae for a screw dislocation placed at zero, zero position. Um, and this is evaluated for elastic isotropic material. Now what happens when you have such dislocation in a material which has a free surface? Well, again, you do the same evaluation. And you now come to the free surface. 
and you evaluate the self, self stress from the dislocation. And here we are in a trouble because the self stress of a dislocation, which is placed at the position X and Y, will not be zero at this free surface. But the point of a free surface means that this free surface must be stress free, right? This is the continuum mechanics condition of a free surface. There are no forces acting on that. So we have additional conditions that need to be fulfilled. So we need actually for our complete mechanical evaluation, we need now to overlay the stress field from a dislocation with another stress field that comes from the uh, sort of interaction of the screw dis or, or this, this dislocation with the free surface in such a way that the sum of these two stress fields is zero exactly at the free surface. Well, the easiest way how to do this, to how to nullify this complicated formulae at the free surface, is to add so-called image dislocation. The image dislocation is an identical dislocation to our really existing dislocation in that material. It just has an opposite Burgess vector and is related into sort of the vacuum, right, above the free surface. But because of that, it generates a stress field which has analytical form identical with our real dislocation at the free surface. And therefore, if I would sum up, I can do this in linear elasticity, when I sum up these two stress fields, they give me zero at the free surface. Finally, I can have a look at the stress field of this hypothetical image dislocation and how does it interact with my real dislocation. And I will interpret this interaction as the interaction between the dislocation, the real existing dislocation and the free surface. Right? And again, um, we can have a look at this evaluation using basically the uh, pitch color force. So the force which uh, uh, is acting on a dislocation based on the external stress field. And now the external stress field is the stress field from this image dislocation, hypothetical dislocation. And what we end up with is that the force on the real dislocation is actually in the direction towards the free surface. So we get here that the free surface attracts the dislocation, right? Well, one of the reasons is that the dislocation could then uh, be annihilated. We would just end up with a free step, uh, with a surface step on the, on the free surface and therefore, thereby we can lower the energy of the system again. We will have no broken bonds anymore in the dislocation. And the same exercise can be done for the edge dislocation. So again, I'm not going here uh, to the details. And once again, it says that the uh, force that acts on the dislocation based on this uh, image dislocation stress field is attractive towards the free surface. And the take home message from here is that the dislocations are attractive to the free surface.